Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alan Bludorn, and it's my good fortune to serve as Associate Dean of the Robert J. Trulass Senior College of Business. And thank you for joining us today for a distinguished alumni lecture, a point I'd like to emphasize and get back to a little bit later. But before we do anything else, I'd like to ask you to do two things. Please make sure right now that your cell phones and laptop computers are shut off. Um, turns out that that interferes with the recording and so forth that goes on here and also could be a disturbance for our speaker. And second, I'd like to ask that everyone remain for the full session that we're going to have. After the talk, there will be a short question and answer session, and I ask you to stay all the way through that. Once again, we're grateful to be able to welcome a successful and distinguished MU alumna to present this lecture as part of the college's speaker series. One of the strategic priorities of the Trulas College of Business is collaboration. That is, joint activities between the college and the business community, as well as between the college and our academic colleagues both here at MU and at other universities. A key to this is it should be a win-win collaboration. From the college's standpoint, collaborations produce almost untold benefits, some of which are adding knowledge about trends, issues, and practices in the business world, sometimes more post-graduation employment opportunities for our students, and just plain old good advice. We like to hope our partners also benefit in significant ways, ranging from a greater likelihood of recruiting top talent to personal gratification from sharing their expertise and experience with you, today's students here in TCOB. The Distinguished Alumni Lecture is a, is a very important part of our collaboration initiative. Indeed, we are very proud of the prestigious list of speakers that have taken part in this lecture series since its inception. For example, this fall, participants in the Distinguished Alumni Lecture include David Novak, Chairman and CEO of Yum Brands, and Tom Lanning, lead consultant of transformation for Australia's Telstra Incorporated. If you desire, please visit the college's website for a complete list of previous participants. In fact, please visit the website for lots of news about TCOB. Now, let me talk about today's speaker. An MU alumna, Jean McKenzie, is the senior vice president of the Walt Disney Company's learning division. In this position, She'll be in charge of a new division focused on creating fun and engaging educational programming for young children around the world. Previously, as mentioned in your event program, she served as president and CEO of Gateway Learning Corporation. In 2005, she led a private equity-backed management team through a business turnaround of the Hooked on Phonics brand, which ultimately led to a merger with Sylvan Learning Educate Incorporated. Prior to that, Ms. McKenzie spent nine years in various marketing and senior management roles at Mattel Incorporated. As Executive Vice President and General Manager of Mattel's Worldwide Barbie Division, you know, a 20th century icon, now 21st century icon, worldwide sales grew from $500 million to, to over $2 billion. Ms. McKenzie graduated from Mizzou with a Bachelor of Science in Marketing, and I might add cum laude, after serving as Student Council President of this college. And we're very excited that she's made time in her busy schedule to return to our campus today. Let me point out that she has spent an entire day with us and has made time for lunch with undergraduate students today and with a small group discussion with our MBA students. Turns out, that she's not only a tiger and an alum of MU, but she's also, she grew up in Columbia and she attended Hickman High School. So I'd like to ask you to put your hands together to welcome back not just a former tiger, but also a CUPE. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karina. Thank you. Thank you all very much. It really is an honor to be here today at the College of Business at Columbia. It's where I grew up, so it does feel a bit like a homecoming for me. I'm very excited to talk to you about a topic that I've spent 20 years and I'm very passionate about, and that's building brands, building great brands. Starting off with Sesame Street and Barbie, I spent almost 10 years of my life with, 
and then most recently for the past two years with the Walt Disney Company. I'm a big believer in brands and the power of brands, so I'm going to talk to you about that topic and hopefully engage you a little bit in thinking about some of the brands that you may or may not know right now. Over the past five years, it really has been a roller coaster for businesses as well as for brands. The internet and other technology advancements continue to democratize and commoditize markets around the world. Never have markets been so fragmented. Never have consumers had so many choices. And after the last three weeks, never have the markets had so much information to try to sort out. So how can a business compete, and how can a business create enduring preference for its products and services? The answer to that question resides in the assertion, don't just build a brand, create a cause. And that's really what I'm here to talk to you about. And I hope over the next half hour, I can explain to you what I mean by that and share with you some of the times that I've had as a global marketer over the last 20 years. But before we do that, I want to play a game with you all. How does that sound? Fun? I've been in the toy business. We have to have fun. Here's how the game's going to work. I'm going to give you some information about a brand. And all I want you to do is shout out what you think that brand is. Don't think, just shout. OK? Here's the first one. What global computer, music, and phone brand allows you to express yourself, feel creative, and cool? Yeah! Apple. What car brand is the ultimate driving machine? Excellent. What global internet service puts the world at your fingertips and helps you find anything, anytime, anywhere? Yeah. OK, this one might be a little harder. What motorcycle brand would you choose if you were seeking to recapture a personal sense of adventure, independence, and self-expression? Harley. OK. The next one is very near and dear to my heart. What global doll brand personifies a little girl's <laughs> fantasy lifestyle of beauty, glamour, and fun? Barbie. And lastly, what global entertainment brand is synonymous with magic and the wonderment of storytelling and characters? Thank you. There's a prize for you. Who got that one? See me after. Disney. So what do all these brands have in common? What do all these businesses have in common? The one thing they all share is a, an unwavering organizational commitment to a common purpose that creates uncommon value. And this is the notion of cause. Organizations that meticulously align their behavior and communications around more than just a promise. They pursue an ideal. These brands don't just create a brand. They really do create a cause. So what the dictionary tells us is that there's a lot of definition for the word cause. I want to use the third one. It's a group of people with a common ideology who try together to achieve certain goals. I would imagine that the University of Columbia here has certain goals, right? As a business school, you've done a phenomenal job of really advancing the brand and the cause over the last 20 years. So I think there's a lot that I'm going to talk about that Mizzou has actually done. And I want to use this notion of this ideology of people banding together for an uncommon cause as we explore the 10 proven practices for activating the potential of brands. And this is a topic that, over the last 20 years, has come together. Some of the brands that I'm going to talk about, you may not even know. Hopefully, most of them you will. These proven practices can be grouped into three fundamental phases. The idea phase, the action phase, and the experience phase. So let's first begin with the idea phase. The first imperative for creating a cause is to infuse a common purpose throughout the organization. It makes clear a reason for the company's existence beyond just making money. It answers the question, what's our higher purpose? What are we really trying to fill? 
And most importantly, a common purpose centers an organization and all of its activities, product development, and communications. It's like the virtuous glue, the thing that binds people together, that inspires them, and connects all of its people. At Starbucks, in 1996, the leadership team got together and really sat down and thought about what's our common, what's our common purpose? It's not about coffee, really. They hired someone named Jim Collins, who wrote a book called Built to Last. Have any of you guys studied that book? Yeah? Great. Big believer. What Jim calls common purpose is a, you guys tell me, big, hairy, audacious goal. Thank you. So it's the same notion. What's the higher calling here? And at Starbucks, it's really not about the coffee. I had the privilege of working with Howard Bihar and Howard Schultz, and there's actually a book that they've written called It's Not About the Coffee. Howard was on my board at Gateway Learning. And really, what the notion is, is that the reason Starbucks was so successful is that they didn't think about the coffee. I'm gonna to read to you what their common purpose was, and tell me if you think this has anything to do with a coffee company to be one of the most well-known and respected organizations in the world known for nurturing and inspiring the human spirit. Sound like a coffee company? Does it sound like a coffee company that when you walked into one of their cafes, they asked for your name? Maybe. Starts to sound a little bit more like the Starbucks that we know. So my point here is that there are many ways that organizations can can create a statement, something that really does infuse and inspire the organization. At Lexus, they did it with something called a covenant. It's a promise that Lexus management made and their associates and their dealers before they ever made a consumer promise to a customer. What it really is, is a statement that suggests a different way of approaching the industry of making cars. Lexus will treat each customer as if we would be a guest in our home. Pretty different than the experience that you have when you go into a car dealership. You don't necessarily feel like you're a guest in somebody's home. But Lexus did it, and they changed the car industry forever. 3M has always had a culture of innovation. But what you may not know, that their common purpose is to solve enduring problems through innovation. It's not words on a piece of paper. It's how the organization really acts. Every week, whether you're in IT or engineering or marketing, you're encouraged to spend 15% of your time thinking about solving enduring problems. Not about what's on your desk that day, but about really thinking about that common purpose. They also have a culture that supports making mistakes because to be innovative, you really do have to make some mistakes and fall down. So the folklore at 3M is a saying that goes like this. You have to kiss a lot of frogs to find a prince. And I'm told they really do live it. Going beyond, the second principle is going beyond differentiation. You can't just make your product different than someone else's. It really has to mean something. Several years ago, there was really a war of words going on in the cellular business. There were lots of companies getting into this business. Not a lot of differentiation. And when there was differentiation, it was really just about features. These three companies, Verizon, Singular, and T-Mobile, had all kinds of slogans. Get more from life. Fits you best. We never stop working for you. Didn't really mean a lot didn't really tell you why their product was something you should prefer and how it was going to solve your problems. A lot of mediocrity going on. And as we all know, several years later, there was a phone that was disruptive. There was a phone that had a purpose that was very different than any of these slogans. So what I want you to know that in the world of marketing and building brands, it's not about words. It's not about a war of words. It's not about statements. It's really about value. But in today's world, it's really more of a commodity economy. 
because there's so much available. So I go back to the dictionary, and the dictionary defines a commodity as an economic good of common or universal value. Gold, there's one, incredibly valuable. It's a commodity. It's the same no matter where you are in the world, totally undifferentiated. A commodity is also a mass-produced, unspecialized product. Just like the pork bellies and the wheat and those things that you see up there on the screen, all of those things are commodities, and lots of businesses are. But I'm here to tell you that a commodity is the polar opposite of a brand, of a valuable brand. So the thing that is important and what I want to tell you about next, principle number three, is really to de decommoditize your business. Don't just explain why it's different. Really deliver on an incremental value. Your brand needs to have something that sets it apart in extraordinary ways. The idea is really, by, by delivering uncommon, enduring value, you form much more of a value for your organization and for your shareholders. Because what you're doing is really creating a preemptive position, a position of ownership in the market. So what do you think about these brands? I want you to tell me if you think they're commodities or if they've decommoditized the industry. Nokia, what do you think? Commodity? Yeah? Who decommoditized it? Apple, with what? The iPhone. The airline industry. How many of you have had good experiences with an airline brand lately? <laughs> oh, I see a hand. Which airline was that? American. Really? OK. Well, they have this slogan several years ago. It was called American Airlines, something special in the air. But not a lot of people found it special. That was the problem. They thought that extra legroom was going to be special. But unfortunately, that legroom kind of went away. So it became really more of a commodity statement. There was nothing that really set them apart because their experience didn't really deliver on it. Can somebody give me an airline that you think has decommoditized the industry? JetBlue, excellent. Virgin, excellent. Southwest, all good examples. In the case of Southwest, their common purpose is not about the airlines. Their common purpose is to make you, their customer, feel a little bit more human every time you're with them. So they sing to you on the plane, and they do all kinds of things to try to make you feel a little more human and not just provide you with extra leg room. Now, I'd argue today that Southwest is changing that, that they may not be holding up to their common purpose and the ideal that they started off with. And the economic climate may, over time, force and test the organization to see if they can really hold that up as JetBlue and Virgin and others come in the space with more value. The third principle that I'm going to talk about it's called pursue the high ground. And what this really is is a pretty simple chart. You've got the truth, and you've got aspiration. You've got unmet needs, and then you've got something at the top that is called the high ground. When you're working on a positioning for a brand or for a company, you always want to start with the truth. You always want to start with something that is an unmet need in the market. But you don't want to stop there. You want to challenge the organization and the company to really provide more, to create more of a way to serve your customers. And with that, you don't just want to make a promise. You want to make the promise. Michelin did it. Talk about an ultimate commodity, tar car tires. Michelin did decommoditize the business in their time. And they did it by pursuing an immutable high ground positioning with safety, because so much is riding on your tires. Another classic example would be ivory, a beauty bar. It's not just soap. It's a beauty bar. And beauty bars are here to keep you clean. So what could possibly be better than pure? David Ogilvy, who wrote this line, said 
0.44% pure, and it's stuck. This is one to think about. Federal Express, they invented the overnight business with an ideal, when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. They invented overnight delivery. But today, I think they're really in the logistics business, and they're struggling to keep their promise of on-time delivery. And they've sort of thrown out the door that their business is about getting the birthday present to your mother on time. And they've left it really open for others to come in, and they're, they're fighting now for share, and they're not at the high ground. So we've talked about these areas first in creating ideas that help form a cause. With actions, there's really three types of actions that companies and organizations can take. Those can be actions that assert and support your position, ones that are neutral to it, or ones that absolutely fly in the face of it. As I referenced earlier, principle number four is really all about using the brand and the value creation as a way to really transcend everything that an organization does. Jim Collins has written a lot about it. In his book, he states that the essence of a visionary company comes in the translation of its core ideology into the very fabric of the organization, into goals, strategies, tactics, policies, procedures, cultural practices, management behaviors, into everything the company does. So here's a company that did that. Do you all know Nordstrom's? What do you know about Nordstrom's? Can you take back something that you didn't really like, but you kept it for more than 30 days? Yeah. Can you take back a dress that you actually might have worn? Yes, they never question you. They always believe the customer is right. Has anyone had any experience with Nordstrom's? Their service is first class. But they're not the Four Seasons Hotel. They're not the highest, highest echelons. They're doing something different because they're providing extraordinary customer service in a retail mass environment. Not a lot of people have done that. Principle number five is bravely assert ownership. Great brands take a stand. They tap into emotions. Sometimes they use superlatives, but they make a statement. Volvo, for years, has said they're the safest car in the world. Do people believe that? I think so, particularly if that's something that is really important to you. Do they have proof of it? Not 100%, but they try really hard to set the highest bar in safety in everything they do. BMW, the ultimate driving machine. You guys knew that one. What does that mean? Does it make you want to buy the car? Does it make you feel like there's something about that brand that is for you? Yeah. Principle number six is the CEO means chief evangelist officer, not chief executive officer. There has to be someone in the organization, whether it's the CEO or not, that is visible, that is vocal, and very believable. Someone internally who can really help everyone understand what you're there for. Why is it that you're working for this company? Not just to make money, but what's the higher purpose? There's been a lot of famous CEOs who've written books, and certainly Steve Jobs is one. He happens to be on Disney's board, and I've met with him, and he is absolutely an evangelist for Apple. His standards for quality and design and innovation are in the stratosphere. I want to share with you a new CEO who's taken on that role for a company that may surprise you. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Ballmer!
I have four words for you. I love this company. Yes! Now, how many of you have heard of Steve Ballmer? Oh, quite a few of you. How many of you have heard of Steve, or Steve Gates? What's his name? Bill Gates. The whole room, right? We've all heard of Bill Gates. He's a very famous CEO of Microsoft. Steve Ballmer has been with that company since its inception and took over as CEO. He has a different kind of passion for Microsoft. And what you saw at a company meeting was him really showing that to the people internally, that he loves that company and he's going to set them on a new course and to gain confidence inside the internal company for what he was about to talk about. So pretty crazy way to open a business meeting, but that's what he did. All right, so we talked about the idea stage and the action stage. Now I want to finish up on experiences. Experiences really are the holy grail of preference for your product and your service. Finding a way that really makes your product endure with the consumer. It's all about the experience. These companies meticulously organize around an ideal, and then they obsess about it. So we talked about Lexus. We've talked a little bit about Disney. I want to tell you a little bit more about Disney. When you go to Disneyland, it really needs to be the happiest place on Earth. It can't be anything less. And that experience takes 450,000 cast members in our five parks around the world to do that. We hire more people than on an annual basis to be cast members at our parks than I think any company in the world. Every one of those cast members is on stage for you, the customer, when you go to Disneyland or Disney World or Disney Paris or Disney Hong Kong. When you go to Disneyland and you saw a campaign that says, where dreams come true, we expect to deliver dreams for you there. So the last couple of years, in all the parks, the company has reached out with very special individualized touches for people. We might know that it's your birthday or your child's birthday. You might get special things in your hotel room. You've given us that information. But it's really all about enhancing the experience and making it something that really does feel like your dream came true. Pine and Gilmore wrote a book, and they talked a lot about this, and I think they sum it up really well. Those businesses that relegate themselves to the diminishing world of goods and services will be rendered irrelevant. To avoid this fate, you must stage a rich, compelling experience. Whether it's an experience selling your car, whether it's an experience at Disneyland, whether it's the experience with riding a motorcycle, all of those things are really about much more than the bike or the park that you went to. It's really about the experience that you've created. Principle number eight is to forge an enduring emotional connection. This is pretty basic stuff. It's really from the perspective of the company you have a motorcycle to sell, or you have jewelry to sell. But that's really not what these two brands do. At Harley, they sell freedom. They sell independence. They sell self-expression. And I'm told they sell, I'm not a middle-aged accountant anymore. I'm not sure if that rings true with anybody here, but they're really not selling a bike. And certainly at Tiffany's, it's not about the jewelry. There's something about when you wear something from Tiffany's, people notice. They know someone loves you. They know someone thinks you're special. And they do it with that little blue box. So there's a lot here about the enduring emotional connection. It doesn't come overnight. It takes a lot of work. Principle number nine is dr dramatize how the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Not everybody is tied. One brand, one big promise, there's a lot of companies that have lots of little products and services. And here's a couple of examples. With 3M, we talked about what they do. They're really about solving enduring problems. Post-it notes were about that. Now there's 50 different kinds of post-it notes. And they're trying to solve problems 
of when you put something on the wall, how can you take it off and it not leave a mark on the wall? Everybody's got that problem. But altogether, the company really stands for doing it in an innovative way. Microsoft is an interesting case. When Steve Ballmer took over, they stopped being a software company. They stopped being a company that was really selling business solutions. Now they say that really what they're trying to do is to solve your business problems, to solve your consumer problems, whatever those might be. I'm not sure that that's going to be compelling, but they're definitely attacking the brand of Microsoft in a new way. The last principle is remember, authenticity is everything. I talked a little bit about Starbucks, and I, and I feel like it's, a, it's an example of really an authentic brand. When they talk about the growers in Kenya, where they have found a coffee that has a different flavor, they really have. When they search for water to sell in their cafes, it's called ethos, because they've found a way to give back in a community and have clean water creating clean approaches to the environment in those markets where the water's coming from. There's something very authentic about what they're trying to deliver, and the future is going to be difficult for them. Most people would say that if they stay true to their ideal, their sales will go down. They might. Howard Schultz is willing to have that happen by closing stores. But what he's not willing to do is to sacrifice authenticity. So I'm rooting for Starbucks. OK, so just to sum up, what I've tried to talk to you about are 10 common principles, things that are really about going beyond being a marketer of brands and slogans, and really thinking about how that sets the strategy for a company and how that sets the course of action for employees and for everything that you do and for everything that you make. And to me, that's what the world needs today, is more people with more ideals that have a sense of trying to create for the customer real value real enduring value. And I think for those businesses that do that, they really are doing more than just creating a business that makes money, that delivers shareholder value. They're, they're really creating a cause. It's something that people can believe in and feel good about and want to work on for a long, long time. So those are my uh, thoughts and things that I wanted to share with you. And I'm happy now to take questions. Let me add to that, uh, we, as Jean just said, we have time for questions here, and we have people with mics in the aisles so that everyone can hear the questions. Try to make your questions focused and direct, and we, we can do follow-ups, too, if, if it gets a conversation going here. So who's got some questions? Uh, I'll start yes, with one if Mike, I could. Your, your last point there on authenticity for Starbucks, I think it's great. And you're right, I'm kind of rooting for them as well. What's the tipping point between maintaining authenticity and, for public company, shareholder value? When does that become something that you have to somewhat forego at the extreme that you really want to hold? Howard Schultz will say he's not going to uh, allow that. I think the events of the last three weeks have changed the game because everyone's stock is down. And I think that the tipping point for Starbucks is really the rubber meets the road when you go into one of their cafes or coffee shops. And if they stop giving you the service that it makes you have an inspiring day, that makes you feel like you've got something special, I, I think it'll, it'll go downhill. My, my only follow-up to that would be, um, his role within the company, as long as he's been there, when does that become an issue? You've been here long enough. Let's mm -hmm. make a change. Mm -hmm. Well, he stepped down from CEO, and then he came back. Um, I think he's more like Steve Jobs than not. I think he's got another day, and I think we'll see it. That's fair. Thank you. Um, I have a question.
question. Like, what is the typical work day for you? What, what do you do in like a typical day like, for your work? The question was, what do I do in a typical day? I'm not sure I've had one in 25 years in business. Um, you need to, to really be ready for every day to seize the opportunity. And for me, a typical day could be something like getting up at 5.30 in the morning and getting on a plane and going to look at a prospective company that we're interested in working with, meeting with those people, evaluating whether or not what they can do for us matches our needs, and coming on a plane and coming home so I can have dinner with my daughter. Uh, the next day might be seven meetings, back to back to back to back, in four different buildings at the Burbank studio where I work. The lot is a really cool place. We film Desperate Housewives on the lot. We have Johnny Depp on the lot. Um, we have four blocks of sort of utopia. It's kind of like a mini Disneyland. So I go to meetings and things that sometimes are opened by, has everybody seen the movie uh, Wally? -E? Yes. So last week I was at a meeting that Wally -E opened, really different. Some days I sit in my office and I do conference calls. Actually, yesterday I was on a conference call to India. We're working with a partner there. So there's a lot of variety in what I do, and that's probably why I keep doing it. Um, in your current position, you're creating fun and educational programming for young children around the world. Are you having any issues breaking into the China market, or, or what's going on there? What, what issues are, are there? Creating fun and engaging, engaging educational products and programming around the world is a 10-year plan. So I'm not biting off China yet. Not yet. Not yet. Tell us about your vision for your new company. The question is, tell, tell about the vision for the new company. Part of what I've been doing over the last 18 months is stealth meaning I can't talk about it. I'm doing something brand new for the Walt Disney Company. We might be buying companies, we might be building things organically, and all those things put together are, are things that at this point I'm not at great liberty to talk about. But what I can say is that what I'm doing is really trying to change the face of learning for young children by taking technologies, digital technologies, virtual worlds and gaming platforms, and making them valuable, making them create an experience that parents will say, oh, I want my child to be playing on the DS, or I want my child to be at the computer. Whereas today, most parents are saying, my, my kids are spending way too much time in front of the screen. My kids are spending way too much time watching television, being on the computer, playing video games. Well, I'm here to tell you that these kids today, at three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's all they know. It's not different for them. It's not weird for them. There's kids scanning the internet at age four better than I can. Now, that might be scary, but the Walt Disney Company has said we need to do something about that. So I have a group of terrific educators from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, from the Stanford Learning Labs, and we're inventing new things that I hope in the next couple of years are going to come to market. But at this point, it really is more long term in terms of the launch of specific products and services that are coming. Gene, hi. So let's talk about something that you can talk about, because I know this has been on my mind, and I'm, I'm sure for most guys. How in the world did you spend nine years working selling Barbies? I mean, what, what, what was that like? Let's, let's, let's learn a little bit more about <laughs> how you worked on such an iconic brand that, that any of us who have sisters or children or nieces uh, just wonder you know, a little bit more about your, your Barbie experience. I could talk for days about my Barbie experience. I joined Mattel Toys in 1989. And I had the distinct pleasure of meeting Ruth Handler, who is a founder of Mattel and the originator of Barbie. And her daughter is actually named Barbie. 
And she has a son whose name is Ken, believe it or not. <laughs> and Ruth and Elliot Handler started Mattel. And Ruth, in the 1970s, was on Wall Street raising money for Mattel. So she herself was such an inspiration, maybe even more than Barbie the doll, because of the vision that she had had and her belief that Barbie was really a vessel through which little girls could play out all their dreams and fantasies of what it was like to be in the adult world. And that positioning was so expansive that we could do all kinds of things with that. And the analysts at the time said that Barbie was a 30-year-old brand, it was mature, we were going to grow 3%. And lo and behold, nine years later, 20% compound growth year after year after year, we kind of broke that down. And it was just fun. It was great to have the company so well backing Barbie and a spirit of innovation. We created some of the first software for girls with Barbie brand. We created a whole new division that launched collectible dolls for adults. We originated a worldwide publishing program that actually put Barbie into books. So it was just a wild and crazy fun ride. I, I don't imagine that I'll ever have nine years of that kind of growth again. Um, but with it came a pace. And um, I think that's probably the toughest thing to deal with is how do you stay true to your family and things that you want to do when you work pretty much all the time? So the years were great, but there were some sacrifices in terms of the time. Ms. McKenzie, I just got back from a trip to New York where I talked to some of the firms um, about the financial crisis and, and how they've been impacted. In your position, how is Disney um, being affected by the financial crisis? Good question. How is Disney being affected by the financial crisis? The way I would answer that is that I would say that the Walt Disney Company has never been in a better position from a cash perspective. Our liquidity and our ability to borrow money at 1.5% when the banks won't even do it at 45 to each other. So the, the financial underpinnings of the company right now are in really good position. We have strong cash businesses and a really strong asset base. We're not involved in a lot of speculative kinds of businesses. So from that perspective, the company over the last three years, because we've had blockbuster hits coming out of the studio, we're actually cash rich right now, which is one of the reasons why I'm in my position looking to invest in new businesses. But what will impact the Walt Disney Company is the trickle down. So the credit markets and all that's gone on in, in Wall Street has really not yet impacted whether or not your family is going to go to Disney World. But it will. So over the next really 12 months, we'll find out the impact on consumer spending and what that does to our businesses. And with that, all the executives in the company will be asked to do scenario planning. So if we have a revenue base of $35 billion, this is our investment spending. If we have a revenue base of $30 billion, these are real numbers, by the way. Walt Disney Company is about a $35 billion company. $30 billion, then some of those investments and expenses are going to be trimmed. And we have to be ready with them quarter to quarter. Not month to month, but quarter to quarter so that we can pace our investment, we can reduce our expenses, and move with how the consumer is either spending or not spending in theme parks, consumer products. Most importantly is really watching the media markets. Disney is, 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 a, is a, a company that's categorized as a media company, but we rely much less on ad revenue than a Viacom or some of the other companies a Fox, where the majority of their revenue really comes from, from ad, from advertisement revenue. So I feel that the company has definitely been ready for something like this, and our CFO, Tom Staggs, has really put us in a great position in terms of our access to short-term cash at financing rates that are very, very desirable, as well as a kind of hoard of cash to buy companies during a time when there's going to be some distressed businesses. Did I answer your question? Great. Oh, 
Okay. <laughs> um, I was just curious. Last year, I read a, we did a case study in one of my classes on Barbie, um, and specifically, like, in Barbie entering new markets and new countries, and how um, different design specifications were changed, and sometimes whole new marketing campaigns had to be created. Um, I was just curious if you worked with that at all, or some special challenges or anything that you um, dealt with when entering new markets with products. It's a good question. In the 90s, Mattel became a global company. In other words, we organized our businesses and our brands globally. We didn't have a domestic group and a quote-unquote international group. So during my tenure, we developed worldwide product and worldwide advertising. But then we created localization programs to augment the basic line. And in most of the Asian countries, that's where the majority of the differences were, if you will. The, the particular aesthetics of some dolls just didn't work in some of the Asian markets, particularly in China and India. Uh, Japan less so because it was much more westernized. Today, I'm probably not as knowledgeable. It's been you know, several years since I've um, been in the Barbie business. But, but there clearly, even back in the, the 90s, was a level of localization to accommodate uh, local preferences. You had it up. Mentioned how important it is to have an evangelist at the head of these strong branded companies um, And as you've seen Starbucks is kind of Depleted in that area after Schultz stepped down as well as people could argue Microsoft's done the same How do you think a company with Apple with Steve Jobs at the helm? i um, kind of driving growth and innovation within the company. How do you think they're going to cope with him stepping down from the company? Or is this to prevent that from happening? I'm sorry, because he's a board of directors, I can't comment on okay. that. Understandable. Or, I guess, for instance, even Warren Buffett, someone who's that strong at the forefront of a company, um, how do you cope with someone like that stepping down or passing away, for that matter? You all may know more about Warren than I do. Right. Um, I don't know who replaces Warren Buffett. You guys have met with him. What do you guys say? He, he has a couple success with Warren Buffett. You won't tell us, though. Yeah. I, I know there's a secession plan. There's, there's plans in all companies. It's who the people are that um, you know, can really carry the torch. And uh, I think that there's an awful lot of big shoes to, you know, to fill there. That, as you've seen, kind of Microsoft struggle once Balmer's taken over. It seems like Bill Gates is coming more to the forefront to kind of bring the image back up. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think, I guess if Steve Jobs was to die, that would be devastating to the company, but at the same time, you'd almost need someone to drive that growth further, wouldn't you? What was the question? Steve Jobs is iconic. You want me to talk about Steve Jobs, and I can't. Okay, okay. <laughs> I guess, how do companies cope with these big leaders uh, stepping down? Or how can they go forward? Well, what, what big companies do have are normally secession plans. Boards require them, and there's a pretty heavy scrutiny. And in the case of the Walt Disney Company, I can tell you that Michael Eisner, who had been CEO for almost 20 years, there was a very large scale effort to name a new CEO. And it didn't just go to Bob Iger, who was the internal candidate. There were lots of external candidates who were brought in and who went through a pretty rigorous interviewing process in, with all different levels in the company. And I think that's probably what is going to be required, is that the talent may not be inside. There may be someone who has a unique background with the timing today that makes sense to replace a Steve Jobs or someone at Microsoft, and it may not be inside. John Lasseter. Does anyone know that name? He is the, uh, really the founder of Pixar and is a creative genius, much like Walt was. John Lasseter is a character, too. He only wears Hawaiian shirts um, and those funny, bright-colored shoes with holes in them. He has about 
Yes, yes, he has about 10 different colors of those. All he wants to do is make the most awesome animated movies. And when he gets up and, you know, talks to us, you feel it. And every new movie from Pixar is not about a formula. There was a rat who became a chef in Paris. Okay, who came up with that idea? You know, $400 million later. There was a uh, robot that was left on a planet and didn't talk for the entire movie? $600 million. So I'd say that, that what John and the team of directors have for the Walt Disney Company is much like what Walt had. It's just a passion and a everything from computer-generated animation and every new anything that's coming along they are looking at and pushing their craft. And from the storytelling side, they're not looking at telling timeless tales. They're looking at really what are the, the ways that we can really communicate and reach and, and do things that are relevant today. So I think that John is very much the person inside Disney who is, who is thinking forward about, um, particularly from the studio side. Hi, Jean. Hi. Do I know you? So. That's my mother and my father and their friend. Did you have a question, Woody? Oh, a good friend you are. Yes. Um, I was just wondering if there was a period of time before you began working for like such prestigious companies like Mattel and Disney where you kind of struggled in the business world, like trying to find your footing or your ground. And um, if so, if there was a period, what did you do to kind of like get through that to where you are now? I've been lucky. I, I started my career 30 days after I graduated from the University of Missouri at Hallmark Cards. And I spent the first, gosh, 18 months getting trained. It was almost like a free MBA. I had like eight jobs the first year. I got to go three months and work in the logistics department and manufacturing and advertising. And, and, I, and I feel really lucky to have had that because it gave me time to sort of figure out what I really wanted to do as my first job. And it was marketing. I wanted to be a brand manager. And I learned that because of having that period of time working in a company to kind of check out how I fit in different roles. And I think that if you can find that, it's really, really helpful. Because you may think you, you know, love accounting. I can't imagine why, but you may. <laughs> I didn't. That was not my forte. But experience is really what allows you to do that. So I feel fortunate. I feel lucky that I, I've worked for companies like Hallmark and Mattel and Disney, and I've found ways to, you know, I think overcome sometimes when I wasn't exactly as happy as, as I wanted to be by talking to people and getting advice from people inside the companies. I have time so, for one more question. Oh, thank you. Um, thanks for coming to visit, by the way. Uh, I wonder, you talked about how you're sort of creating a new idea for Disney in terms of getting into this market that doesn't actually exist yet. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, sort of developing products and or services that meet needs people don't even know they have um, and that they may or may not discover along the way. But that idea of going out into a world that doesn't mm -hmm. actually exist yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. The first six months of my job was really doing research, both consumer research in terms of asking people, both parents and kids, what they were missing, going into homes and actually journaling and seeing what media kids were using and what products and services they liked and didn't like, not from what they self-reported, but from what my team observed. So I think that that's a big, important step for companies to take. It's not like we're just going to risk 50 million bucks here. 
We've done a lot of research with our customers, with our consumer, with our, hopefully our customers, with consumers. And we look at a lot of data that is projecting um, both the amount of time that kids will spend watching TV, uh, playing sports, playing musical instruments, and we really understand kind of what the leisure time is for kids, so that we're trying to create products and services that fit into that, not just let's take a flyer and see if you know, this new innovative stuff will work. The invention process is what's really tricky. So I have this really cool team of, of people that are called Imagineers. It's a combination of being an artist and an engineer or having some technical as well as some um, uh, training in industrial design or art. And coming up with what that actually is, is definitely, to fit those needs, is definitely the risky part. Um, but what I believe in is lots and lots of consumer research along the way. And don't go too far, too fast, without really checking in with some prototypes of what you're building to see if kids can play with it, and if they like it, and if parents will pay for it. Well, Ms. McKenzie, thank you very much. And I have one last thing to do. Who was the person up in the top who answered the first question? I have your prize. Okay, I'm coming. Now, if I could ask everyone to hold on for maybe another two minutes. Most you of are. you know what I'm going to do at this point, but I need to do something we don't normally do here either at this time. And as Ms. McKenzie is coming back down the stairs here, of course we're going to say thank you to her in some tangible ways. But I need to make a comment on something else. Because if you notice towards the end of her slideshow, one of the characteristics of the experience that needed to be delivered was to meticulously deliver the details and the elements of that experience. And I must say, I have to apologize on behalf of the College of Business because we failed to deliver to you meticulously the proper environment for making the presentation given the problems with the slides. And I would normally have said that in private, except I wanted to emphasize to you, did you see how she managed that? After it became clear that the equipment was not going to correct itself, Ask she, for human she, help. She, she fixed the problem. And did you notice how much better we could attend to the content of what she said? rather than the problem that was going on. And I think we can all identify with that, because at some time or another, the equipment is not going to work 100% perfectly. And the gracious way that you handled that problem was just extraordinary. But would we expect anything else from a tiger? And we will look into that. That's not what we intend to deliver, and we'll figure out what's wrong and, and fix it. With that, let me say thank you very much, and here's a plaque in appreciation to Jean Ann McKenzie, Distinguished Alumni Lecture, October 23rd, 2008. Thank you very much. And in here, I think you'll find some tiger memorabilia. Excellent. Thank you so much.